through the book of Psalms. We're just going to start there. Psalms 133, verse 1. Psalms 133, verse 4. I heard you guys had a very great service last week. I really appreciate uh, the support that you give Pastor Cheryl when we're not here. That is very important. All right? Psalms 133, verse number 1. And it reads, How wonderful it is, how pleasant, for God's people to live together in harmony. It is like the precious anointing oil running down from Aaron's head and beard down to the collar of his robes. It is like the dew on Mount Hermon falling on the hills of Zion. That is where the Lord has promised his blessing, life that never ends. And so we want to talk about this called uh, the place of unity, the mandate of the season. It's an old message, but all messages when it's given from God are good. Now, for me, I needed this. I needed this today. Now, I don't know where everybody uh, are in, in your life as far as things happening in our nation, but sometimes I can get sensitive in the spirit, and I have to discern what is this going on inside me. Um, is it is it something that is natural that is mine or that's something that's actually happening out in society what is it that's really stirred been stirred up on the inside and in my spirit i can get stirred up depending on what's happening and so uh as we sometimes watch the news news has not been very good uh, there's nothing uh, in it that's good and so sometimes you may need to give yourself a break from the news when you look around, I don't see any unity. We're called the United States of America. We need to drop that word united for a while because there is nothing united about us right now. Is that like a pack of dogs, a pack of wolves at each other's throat all the time? Now, I don't know why. I do understand that it's something in the spirit realm that is in operation that is stirring things up. I do not understand why the church as a corporate entity, those that, again, you heard me say this, that has a world platform, is not speaking into those things. It's like the church has chosen to be silent, not to say anything. Here's my question to you. Just because the, the, the church at large is silent, are we silent? Because we also have a voice. If we're not careful, and I'm saying this because of what I said previously, those who have a national or world platform should be speaking into this. Now, I heard myself correct myself. That sounds crazy, don't it? Self correct yourself. No, I didn't say that. Okay. We've talked here before in dealing with apostolic and the prophetic. You never know what your true platform is. Sometimes we're giving uh, people platforms just because we see them on television and they, not, they don't necessarily have a worldwide platform. What they have is good PR. And if you've got good PR, you can be anywhere, all right? So having said that, we need to start looking at ourselves correctly. Who are you in the spirit? What is it God has called you to do? What is the, 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 the anointing, the power, the strength that he has given you to do in this world? So we have to start looking at ourselves from the scripture and from what God has said about us. Now, for me, this is my comfort zone. I have to come back here every now and then to bring clarity to me. Uh, when I read this, or when I preach this, it helps me to understand who I am and what I have been called to do. Now, that could be local, state, national, or international. I don't know, only God knows. But what I do know is that we must be true to who God has called us to be. We must be true to our own selves and don't worry about what other people are doing. What are we doing? That's the question. In Isaiah chapter 58, verse six through eight, is not this the fast that I have chosen? to loose the bonds of wickedness, 
to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the poor who are outcast into your house? Will you see the naked to cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light shall break forth as the morning, and your healing shall spring forth quickly, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your reward. This is what Isaiah said, that this is the true fast of God. These are things that we can do. These are things that we should do. Fasting is good, but fasting just for yourself is even better. Now, how many understand that fasting does not change God? Fasting only changes us. But the fast that he's talking about is to do something specific. Go out and make a difference. When we do that, we need to understand that we're going counter to the culture that is in this world. Right now, the culture is don't do anything. Every man for himself and hopefully God for us all. But that's not what the scripture tells us. We're going to be emissaries of Christ, and we need to begin to walk like he walked. Turn in your Bibles again to the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 18 through 19. See, Jesus had a mandate. He had a, a specific direction from his father as to what it is he's supposed to be doing. He never varied <coughs> from that at any time while he was on earth. I think this is where we get in trouble we have a tendency to look and see what other people are doing, and it looks like they are prospering, look like they are growing, so we think, well, maybe they got some clues, or maybe they know something that we don't know, so we're going to go over to their conference, we're going to spend our money, we're going to go over there to our conference, and we're going to sit there, we're going to listen to hear some truths that's going to help impact our ministry. Well, in actuality, you can get some things from them but is it really going to impact your ministry? Is it really going to impact you? Specifically, that person was called for a specific thing. You have been called for a specific thing. To get what you need to make it move, make it go, is not to go to a man to get what you need. It's to go back to the one that hopefully sent you out. See, God knows what we need. God knows how he has equipped us. And so Jesus understood that. He said, my meat is to do the will of the Father. That's how I eat. When, I do, when I'm doing the will of the Father, I, got all, I have all the meat I need. We've got to understand that we have a purpose. We have a mandate. All right? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus said, because he has anointed me, talking about his Father, to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This is what Jesus said that his mandate was, or this is what his orders are, his orders are from his father. He understood that. The religious people around him did not. They continuously tested him to try to trip him up, to show that he was a fraud. Unfortunately, we have a lot of distractors today who will try to trip you up, try to make you seem like a fraud. But here's, here's the problem with that. It's easy to ensnare us, entrap us, because we're fallible. We do make mistakes. Jesus was perfect. He didn't make any mistakes. So in, in trying to be his emissaries, we first have to acknowledge that we are doing this basically with one hand tied behind our backs. And that one hand being is we are fallible. We can and we do make mistakes. But we should not allow our mistakes to stop us from doing what we believe God has called us to do. I believe that God took all of that into consideration when he called us. I mean, after all, he's God. He know when we're going to mess up before we mess up. Now, he tried to put things out to stop us from going off the rail, from going over the cliff. And if we ignore those things, guess what's going to happen? You're going over the cliff. You're going to fall off the rail. 
Our God understands that we are human beings, and yet he has chosen to use us, that which is fallible, to decree and proclaim his message of grace. Not sloppy grace, but true grace. All right? Jesus had five clear directives. You know, I like to talk to pastors, and I need to go back and redo my own thing. When I say my own thing, I'm talking about my own purpose. Why did he call me? I tell people I run into, they, they're shocked when they say, you're a pastor. I say, not by choice. They say, what do you mean not by choice? I mean, I didn't choose to be no pastor. If I was going to make a choice to choose anything, that would not have been on the list. Okay? So we never know what we are called to do until we are willing to get face to face with God and allow him to speak to us both from his word, both from his apostles and prophets, and even some children sometimes can help direct you into where you're supposed to go if you learn how to listen to them. And so Jesus had these five clear directives. He did not go one way or the other from them. He said, my, this is to preach the gospel. Number one is to preach the gospel to the poor. Well, who are the poor? He's not talking about those who don't have any money. He's not talking to those who are homeless. We all were poor, and we're still poor in spirit. Listen, if, if we could change ourselves, change our own situations, change our own circumstances, change our life from living haphazard, living like crazy, then Jesus would never have to die. He died because he understood that we didn't have anything within us that would make us change or to empower us to change. I was reading this. I didn't get to finish reading, but it was an article that I came across on the internet. Can you legislate morality? Well, some of our people in the nation think you can. Get more judges, build more jails, hire more policemen. We're going to do this. No, you're not legislating morality. You are suppressing people. God, Jesus didn't come to suppress us. He came to set us free. He understood that the only way that we can be free, we first have to have a born-again experience. I don't care if it can be the highest court in the land. In fact, even the highest court in the land, even the judges, the Supreme Court judges, are sinners. And they need Christ. It's, you know, sometimes I think about that. It's sort of hilarious. Here you are sitting up there passing judgment. But where is the judgment coming from? Because you are not really using the letter of the law. I understand, I found out, I had a, a, an attorney to help me understand that the law is for interpretation. And so I can interpret that any way I want to. But when we come to the scriptures, it's not given to any private interpretation. So what I'm saying is those who are sent as our judges will have a judge that's going to sit there and judge them. And so it is, it is upon us to begin to speak out from the word of God, the truth of God. None of us are perfect enough to pass judgment on nobody. But yet, some of them have been given that job. That is their calling. That is their job. And they're supposed to do the best that they can based on the law and not because of how you feel about the situation. Right. It was disheartening for, I had been in an accident and uh, this tractor trailer, I had just paid off my Chevrolet S10 red pickup truck. I mean, I really liked that truck. That was my sports car. And on the way to therapy, this truck, or the driver of the tractor trailer, decided I'm going to time the light. And by the time I get there, it will be green. I just go right through it. He mistimed the light. And his light was red when he went through. And of course, I'm halfway in the intersection of a green light. And next few moments, I ain't know anything. And when I finally got my senses back together, what hit me? Yeah. And looked out at one, here's this big old truck pushed up against my truck. And I'm pushed up against a tele uh, telephone pole. And I'm sitting there trying to figure out. How did that happen? I had a green light. There was no nothing in front of me because he misjudged the light. We have a tendency to misjudge people the same way. 
we have a tendency to look at people and because of our own inherent biases, we'll make a decision not because it's right, but because of our own biases that we still deal with. To me, that's scary. To me, it's better to not make a judgment, just listen to a person, know that, learn that person before you come to a conclusion about that individual. See, God doesn't have to do that. He knows all of us. And Jesus knew what he was doing when he started out on his mission to go and set the captives free. He said, I'm here to heal the brokenhearted. Our land, our world is full of brokenhearted people. And brokenhearted people has a tendency to do things to try to make them feel better. But unfortunately, a lot of the things that they're doing is actually hurting them. But they think, I'm feeling better. I remember years back, people would ask me, why do you drink? Now, listen, I wasn't a Christian. I didn't know nothing about him and healing. All I understood was, I'm trying to mask a pain. And I was shocked myself when I said that. I said, what are you talking about? Mask of pain. All I can tell you is I, I felt that something was wrong. I was in pain. It wasn't a physical pain. Right. And so my goal of drinking was not to have fun, but to dull that ache, to dull that pain. Now, the problem with that is that the next day you still have the pain, the original pain. <laughs> now you have a secondary pain called a hangover. Now, you can take some Amazon. Back in the day, it was Amazon. I would take about three or four of those, and it would take care of the headache. But the emotional pain was still there. And my question became, how do I heal a broken heart? You can't. Only God can. So we have people out in our society who are operating from that area where their heart has been broken, their heart has been hurt. My God, we even have preachers preaching, and they're preaching out of their own pain. But they don't understand that. This is why I believe God has called us to not just preach the gospel to the poor, but also to help heal the broken in heart. We've been called to preach deliverance to those who are in captivity. How many of us knew we were in captivity until someone pointed out to us that we were in bondage? None of us did. My God, we thought we was having fun. You know, scripture do say that there is pleasure in sin. Hey, God acknowledges that, that there is pleasure in sin. Then he comes right in the same verse and say, but it's only for a season. It's a short-lived time. Because eventually, not only are you going to hurt yourself, but you're going to wind up hurting other people around you because we're sinners. I tell people, listen, what did you expect from them? Sinners can only do what's in their nature to do, and that is sin. Now, I have a little problem with those of us that confess to be born of the Spirit of God. And we're still doing the same thing, still sinning, and we're doing it intentionally. I have a problem with that. But those who have never expressed Christ as a Savior, I don't have a problem with them because I only I understand that they're acting out of their nature. But those of us who have been born again, we have to fall back on 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 on through. If you have been born of the Spirit of God, you are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Your hope all have become brand new. And so we are not supposed to continue to operate where we used to operate. If we are, then we need deliverance. We need to go through ministry because there is something that is not right on the inside. I like to call it, there is a second soul that is on board. Now, people have a hard time grasping, what do you mean there's a second soul on board? Well, I always say, any time that you are being pressured on the inside to do stuff, if you are being harassed to do stuff, if you are being pushed to do stuff, and you've done everything in your power not to do it, you've prayed, you've fasted, you're standing on the Word of God, and you still have this pressure, you need to understand that it's not really coming from you, even though it's coming out of you. There's another soul on board. The Bible talks about spirits. They have a soul but they have no body. And they like our body. And so when we look at the end of the day, this is what the majority of us are dealing with. My God, I mean, think about it. Your neighbors, your family members, 
even your children, are dealing with uh, demonic contamination. I didn't want to hear that myself when I started in, in ministry. Uh, Bishop, Episcopal, got talking about yeah, even your children are demonized up there. Why are they demonized? You know, you talking about little kids. How, why are they demonized? That is that because you are. That's because I am. Because, yeah, because you are. And you have done things unintentionally to them which causes them to begin to be demonized. So when we start looking at this, it's a whole ball of wax that's in working out here. And so we need to start understanding and go back to the scriptures and look at the scriptures again. Again, he said, I'm here to preach the gospel to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, and bring sight to the blind. To those who can't see. He's not, I'm not going to talk about uh, physical blindness. Spiritual blindness. You got eyes that you can see, but you don't see. You're looking, but you're not seeing anything. There's a whole other world that is out here. And all you need are spiritual eyes to begin to see the truth. One of my uh, great things I like to do is when I'm talking to people, is to watch them, look at them. Really look at them. Don't look down at their feet. Don't look at the apparel that they're wearing. Don't look at the jewelry that they Look at them. And the only way you can look at them, you got to look them in their eyes. Right. People get a little nervous <laughs> when you're looking into the eyes. And you'll see them start to fidget, move around. And then some of them ask, why are you looking at me like that? The honest answer is this. I want to see who I'm really talking to. Because what do you mean? I want to know if I'm really talking to you or someone that's representing you from the inside you. I don't get that. As I understand, you know. But there is another individual that is present. Sometimes you can feel it. Sometimes you can sense it. But my God, when you see him move in people's eyes, you, you're going to be totally convinced that there's something that's wrong with this picture. So you've got to practice when you talk to people, look them in their face, look them in the eyes, and talk with them. Now, when I'm saying talking to them, you know, we start off in the narrative, we might talk about the weather, or you might talk about how it feels, or maybe raining or whatever. But eventually, you gotta go from the natural to the supernatural, all in the same space. And you do that because you are a spirit that walk in the spirit, and that you can sense and you can see spiritual things. Now, I'm not saying that you can look out here and see a demon, or you can look out and see God. That's not what I'm talking about. But yet you can look when you have been, when you have practiced, I love that word. That's what Paul said. We have to practice using spiritual things, okay? And so when we are looking, in, 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 uh, looking for the enemy, in people's eyes, all you gotta do is watch. And eventually, when you switch gears and start talking about spiritual things, they get nervous and they begin to move. They begin to switch. It's unnerving, unnerving to tell you the truth. Because the first time I saw that, I was at a deliverance workshop and I was ready to quit. Because I said, this is not right. And this is what's not right. I said, what I just saw, that had to be in my mind. He said, what did you see? I saw a pair of eyes blink, blinking. And it wasn't their eyes. I said, I'm, I think I'm done. I said, sit by that, give me a break. <laughs> no, Apostle. He said, you saw what you saw. Just keep sitting there because you're going to see more. By this time, I'll be honest with you, I didn't want to see any more. Because that unnerved me. To be looking in a person's eyes, and you look in the eyes, and you see another pair of eyes, and they blink. Do that. Just blink one time. Look at it. It's how quick they were. When it happened, you saw it. And you say, Am I seeing things? Or was that for real? It's making any sense to you. Now imagine in our society, you're talking to people. Now you are aware of what where you should be looking, what you are looking for. Imagine begin to see this in different people. This is not to frighten you or to frighten them. 
This is to make you aware that we are in a spiritual war and we're losing the war. We're losing the battles. We're losing it because we're not used to the correct weapons. Instead of, being, instead of arguing with each other, we need to learn how to listen to each other and just watch. The enemy will always show his hand one way or another. Usually, if you don't see another pair of eyes looking back at you, usually the person would get fidgety. They want to drop their head because you were looking into that. That is not them. Right. That's the enemy that's trying to distract you to leave him alone. He knows what you're up to. Now, again, this is something that we have to practice. We used to do this all the time. When did we stop? It's a healthy practice. I don't care where you go. Because listen, your life may depend on it. I think we need to know who's really for us and who's against us. This is why, listen, out of every human being in this world, Christians should have discernment. We should be able to discern good and evil. We should be able to discern who is who wants to hurt us and who don't. Oh, this is practice. Jesus says, listen, I don't, need, I don't need nobody to tell me about man. I know all about man. Now, let's be honest. We know a lot about ourselves. Can we, can, we, can we acknowledge that? We know our shortcomings. We know areas where we need to pick it up a little bit. We know areas where we need to push, push hard in. We, we know ourselves. But the enemy knows us better. That what you think you know about yourself, he know a hundred times more about you. Even down to your DNA. And this is who we're battling. This is who we're fighting. This is who God sent his son into the world to raise up a church, to raise up people that's able to continue on after he left. And this is what we're supposed to be doing. Turn to Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Now, like I said, this word is for me. I'm encouraging myself with the very message that he gave me to preach to all of you. Even the preachers need to be encouraged. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says this. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Listen, how many commercials have we seen about oppression and depression? The pharmaceutical companies are making billions of dollars based on people's oppression and depression. What is the church doing? Half the church don't even believe this. And those who believe it don't really push it, don't really acknowledge it. Because they believe that Christians can't have a demon. So why are you sitting on a psychiatrist's couch waiting for another prescription because the first one or two didn't work? Something's wrong. Something is going on. You know, I'd rather have this opportunity to find out is it me or is it a demon? Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that we don't have problems outside of the money. We do. All right? Everything is not a demon. But if it's a demon, let's call it what it is. It doesn't hurt to go find out. It won't take you, but maybe five minutes, 15 at the most. I challenge you, if you've never had deliverance ministry, you've been curious about it, maybe you need to pay a visit, make an appointment be even better. So I'm curious. I have these issues going on in my life. You know, I've, I've gone to the doctor. They, they can't seem to help me. So I just want to maybe I maybe I have something what you're talking about. Only way you're going to find out, though, is be willing to take a risk. Now, I'm taking a risk saying this. But I am convinced, based off my own life, 
and the hundreds of people that we minister to, that there is something amiss, and there is an enemy that is amongst us, and we have not found him out yet. Mainly because we haven't really been looking for a specific enemy. As much as we go with our feelings, I feel this way, or I feel that way. How many of you got feelings? Sometimes your feelings are all jacked up. Let's be honest. You know, I mean, I got up some days, and I wasn't quite sure how I feel. I'm still trying to figure out, okay, I mean, I feel something. I'm not quite sure what I'm feeling here. You know, I went to take care of a, a job for my wife, and I got in the building, and I felt confused. I mean, I've cleaned that building at least 20 times. I'm standing in there, and all of a sudden, I didn't know where to start. I said, this is not right. I had to shake myself. Come on, we get all these feelings, they can get jumbled up, and we're not sure what's going on. All right? And if you talk to people like that, they're going to think you're nuts. But let's be honest. Our feelings can get all jumbled up, and it's not necessarily a demon. You can just have an all day. Or you can have things that you've been thinking about that stirred up all the emotions. Everything's not a demon. But the point about the emotions is this. They will lie to you. Well, there's nothing wrong with me. I've come to the conclusion, I just didn't want to do it. That's what I ended up with. I said, I know what your problem was. You never settled it in your mind that you had to do this. And so my emotions got caught up and went ahead of me. And that was crazy. But it happens, all right? 1 John chapter 3, verse 8b. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's works. The reason why he came was to destroy the devil's works. This is why the church was birthed. This is why the Holy Spirit came into us. This is why we're being empowered with the Holy Ghost. So that we can, we can finish what Jesus started. My God, we're, we're not doing a very good job. Well, I mean, look, look at things like they're worse now than it was 20 years ago. But it's not. It just appeared to be. All right? But as believers, we're supposed to finish what Jesus started. Jesus didn't destroy all of the devil's work. He destroyed what was in his area of ministry. What's in your area of ministry? Let's think about that for a second. You know, I heard uh, some people blame it on the Democrats because we got poverty. But my God, if we got Republicans all over the place, we still have poverty. Jesus said you will always have poverty with you. It's not a Dem Democrat problem. It's not a Republican party. I mean, a Republican problem. It's a people's problem. It's a spiritual problem. And it's the church's responsibility to begin to attack those problems, not just sit back and hope they're going to go away or sit back and hope that choo-choo train come and take us out. Choo-choo train, not choo-choo train. Um, airplane, whatever they think is going to happen. We are here to fight, not with each other. We have an opponent. He is relentless. He never quits. He never gives up. And he keeps us at odds with each other because we haven't figured out that flesh and blood is not my enemy. When will we learn that? We quote it. Everybody quotes it. They turn right around and start fighting each other again. I say, I say that devil has done such a good job. I mean, Christians are quote that script and still fighting one another. We bless the husbands and wives. They battling each other. And I say, why y'all fighting? And let's go back to the scriptures. What do the scriptures say? That flesh and blood is not our enemy. But yet, here we are. Why? Because we don't understand things spiritually. We have a tendency to look at everything now, but no, there is something that's going on behind the scene. All you got to do is take a step back and look. You can see it, but you got to want to see it. This is what deliverance to me is. We want to see what the problem is. Now, let me clarify. If you really know me, you, you don't, you're not going to see me out there chasing demons. I don't do that. I have a life. My life does not include chasing demons. You know, I like doing other things, normal things. You know, like going 
going up to the water and fighting that water. Hoping, you know, that, you know, I don't drink, I don't swallow so much today. Or going to the gym, exercising. Just normal things. Learn how to eat healthy. Not chasing demons, but here's, here's the point. If one show up, I'm not going to shy away and run from it either. Why? Because he did not give me a spirit of fear. He gave me a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. I don't run. When you know what it is, you don't run. You have a power, you have a power to deal with it. But then you got to deal with the replication afterwards too, just like Paul did. That lady, that girl followed Paul around. These men are from the most high. Hear them, Paul. I don't need your advertisement. Come out of her. Then they got mad because she made these people a lot of money. Maybe that's the problem. There's a lot of money that's generated in church. So if I don't mess with your money, you'll keep coming bringing more money. But you'll go home the same way you came. Broke, hurt, and disappointed. And then you're going to get mad and going to quit going to church. And then all churches are your problem now. Because one church messed over you. All the churches are wrong. All the priests are wrong. All the pastors are wrong. No. All of us didn't hurt you. Truth is, 99% of us don't even know you, never seen you, never met you, so why are you lumping us all together? Why? Because that's what Satan's ploy is. The more I can lump you all together, I can quieten your voice, I can make you disappear. Or people don't see you any longer. So he came to destroy the works of the devil. What's the, what should be our responsibility? Then why are we trying to destroy each other? If we don't do it physically, we destroy each other's reputation. Like I said, I don't know you. I listen, and I've been around some of you guys 20 years, but can I say I know, know you? I know a lot of things about you. All right? That make any sense? But there are things that you would never allow me to see because it is too sensitive, it is too private. So you keep that area blocked off. You don't want nobody to see that. Let's be honest. Only God can see that. And listen, you wouldn't show it to God either, but he's God. You can't help but let him see it. I tell people about relationships all the time, especially husband and wife. I said, listen, bro, you haven't really earned the right for her to tell you all that shit. But I'm her husband. And you still have to earn her trust. When you're dealing with hurt people, they're not just going to voluntarily open up and let you see. No. Because they've been hurt, they're going to keep that area tight and closed. I don't care if you're married 50 years, you're going to have to earn that trust to get there. And not get there and destroy them, but get there and understand that it's okay. I still love you. So we, we, we don't know how to do that. Because we're still jer jerked, jerking, jerked up in our own emotions, is what I'm trying to say. Our emotions are still jerking us all around the place. Scripture says that we're supposed to come in and give each other a holy kiss. Well, let's be honest. Like, like they said at this meeting was in. Women, make sure you bring your pocketbooks. Because everybody there ain't safe. <laughs> Blew me away. I was at a Kenneth Hagin meeting. You know, because all women left their purse where they were sitting. And when he said that, they all turned back <laughs> where he grabbed their purse. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, he's got a point. Everybody in here are not holy. All right? The devil come in with you. All right? So, that's why the scripture tells us to get to know each other. The, the word know, is a, it's a, it means mean intimately, not sexually, but intimately. Agape love. Know each other. Know what's going on in people's lives. This is the only way that we can help each other. We've got to be, be able to say, listen, I trust you. You're not going to hurt me. Again, none of us are perfect. But like we said a couple weeks ago, love never intentionally hurts you. In fact, love will protect you. Love will stop a bullet for you. Why? Because hey, we care. This is where the body of Christ is supposed to be. But we're not there. Only God knows we're going to get there. 
But here's the truth. This is what Paul talked about, the, the five-fold anointing. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. It's our responsibility to teach, train, and activate you until you become mature and you go out and do the same thing. I think there's a lot of babies in the church that are operating as pastors. <laughs> there's a lot of babies in the church. This is why they fuss and fight and cry and kick and scream. I mean, I ain't allow my kids to do that. You know, you get to do it one time, that's it, enough of that. Were they perfect? No, but they know how to obey. What am I saying? Christians don't even know how to do that. You know why? They got too many gods out here. Anytime they want to do something, God said for me to do it. They don't care if it's anti-scripture. Show me that in the Bible. I ain't got to show it. He told me to do it. Okay. I'll give you that. But here's the downside to that. When that proves to be false, you left me nowhere to go. Because I'm obligated to say what you just said. Right. Even though I don't believe it. I've had people say, yeah, well, I messed up. Well, I, I know you messed up, but you gave me no recourse when you pulled out the God card. That's the trump in the deck. No one can do anything about that. But when you say God said, you just cut every resource off. We do that because we get ready to do something and we don't want you to say nothing about it. That's all it is. Keep your mouth shut because God told me to do it. I think scripture says that we're supposed to get counsel. And the multitude of counsel is what? Strength. That's wisdom. I don't know about y'all. I mean, when I was younger, I made a lot of dumb decisions because I never got counsel. I just thought that that was a good idea. I never dreamt that the idea could have been coming from someone else other than me. Are you with me? Yeah. Because we got ourselves in a lot of trouble because we took a thought and we got to understand where thoughts originate from. At least I didn't at that point of my life. I didn't realize we got thoughts from all these different sources. Well, that's the rest for the day. But Jesus had a mandate and he passed it down to us. We got to decide what are we going to do with that. We look at our society, we look at our neighbors, we look at people, and we can see trouble. But how do you help? How can you reach out? You see it, but how can you help them? Now that's the dilemma. You know. That's the dilemma. How do you help? It's you don't just barge into people's lives, I don't think. You know, maybe you guys got a better idea. But I believe it happens through relationships. Sometimes we have to go and intentionally begin to make relationships outside of the relationships that we have. This is what God did. That's what he did with us. You know, I used to hear you stand to your feet, we're afraid. You used to hear this old saying, God found me. Hmm. Well, that's not quite so. Well, I found God, that's not quite so either. Because first of all, God wasn't lost. No, he wasn't lost. Secondly, physically you wasn't lost. You was lost spiritually. So it's not that we found him as much as he introduced himself to us in ways that we could not deny it. Well, that's my story. I'm going to stick to that. Yeah. 